Hello everyone and good evening. My name is Don Arleth and you're watching World News Tonight here on TVP World. Tonight we continue our coverage on the effects and aftermath of the recent storms, massive floods which swept across Central Europe. We have our correspondents out in the field with Ovidius Nietzschea reporting from Wrocław, Poland, Marek Steele reporting from Opava, Czech Republic, and Aaron Daman is in Budapest tonight. The final toll of the massive flooding is still unclear, but we've got the latest for you here on World News Tonight. Now that's still ahead, but first off, let's take a look at the headlines. Viktor Orban downplays the effectiveness of flood aid from Brussels. The EU calls for lifting restrictions on Ukraine, striking military targets in Russia. And Lithuania cracks down on Belarusian media. The European Commission will help flood-stricken countries with 10 billion euros in flexible cohesion funds. The announcement came during a visit of European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to Wrocław in southwestern Poland. Our reporter, Ovidiusz Nietzschea, is in Wrocław. Good evening, Ovidiusz. Uh, can you tell us what were the effects of this meeting today? So the flood summit has just finished here in Wrocław in Lower Silesia, a city largely unaffected by the flood so far, but the region uh, of Lower Silesia and the neighboring Opola region were heavily affected. That's why the Polish Prime Minister organized here the European flood summit, um, invited where leaders of countries which were hit the most in this region, uh, Prime Ministers of the Czech Republic and Slovakia, but also the Chancellor of Austria and of course um, the President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen, who here in Wrocław said that the victims of the flooding are not alone. Take a listen to her announcing the 10 billion euros in cohesion funds for rebuilding um, after the flooding. These are extraordinary times and extraordinary times need extraordinary measures. At first sight, 10 billion euros are possible um, to mobilize from the cohesion funds for the countries that are affected. Um, this is a emergency reaction now. Thank you very much again for the fast convening of this group. The bottom line from this meeting is that all of the participants were very satisfied with the results. The Prime Minister of Slovakia, Robert Fico, even said that he has never seen a European Union meeting um, being so effective in such a short time because the meeting itself lasted some 40 minutes um, and um, the results are, as you have heard, 10 billion euros uh, for the flooding victims. Ovidius well, Zinzhe reporting there from Wrocław. Thank you for your report. Now we move on to the Czech Republic and Czech cities and towns are still struggling with the aftermath of the flooding. Our correspondent Mark Steele is traveling across the most heavily affected areas. One of them is Opava. Now, Marek, where, what is the situation like exactly where you are in Opava? It was struck very hard. Well, as you said, Opava is one of those Czech cities uh, that were struck the hardest uh, by this uh, recent flooding. The piles of stuff you can see behind me, well, they're twice as big as they were yesterday because the Czechs continue the cleanup effort uh, of their town. But not only houses of regular residents were flooded in this flood, the city of Opava is struggling with many of its venues being flooded. I'm speaking about schools, preschools and an animal shelter. Actually, today we managed to visit uh, the animal shelter in Opava. Their volunteers and the employees of the shelter are still shoveling mud out of their building. And more about the struggle of the people of Opava with the aftermath of the flooding in my next report. The water is no longer muddy and no longer deadly. But as it receded, it revealed the extent of damage inflicted on the town. I must say that every hand, every bit of help is invaluable, because there's just so much work to do, as you can see for yourself. The river Opava flooded large parts of the city of 50,000 with the same name. The local animal shelter was inundated by two meters of water. We need to get the place running again and cleaned thoroughly. Many of the kennels and dog houses that the dogs used are damaged and soaked with water. 
This is what large parts of the city center look like. Piles of ruined furniture and mud. Many businesses have been affected by the flooding and schools are closed. We have about eight uh, basic schools which are underwater, so the, the schools are closed. Uh, the kindergarten, about six uh, which are closed. Many, uh, many bike roads are de uh, destroyed, yeah. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pedestrian ways which are also uh, destroyed. This is the railway line connecting Krnov, a city that was badly flooded, with Ostrava, the largest uh, city in this region of the Czech Republic. We see the rail tracks have been damaged, the rocks from beneath them have been washed out. We see asphalt from a nearby road uh, covering the tracks. It will take billions of Czech crowns to rebuild the damage inflicted by this heavy flooding. The authorities have set up a special bank account. Anyone can donate to help the affected put their lives back together. Marek Steel, TVP World. And Marek, very uh, powerful images there. Thank you very much for that. And uh, now we move on a little bit further south. The fallout from Storm Boris is being felt as far south as Hungary, including the tourist capital of Budapest. Our correspondent Aaron Dahman is there and now joins us live. So, Aaron, how has the situation developed today over in Budapest? Good evening, Don. Well, Budapest is well and truly feeling and seeing the impacts of Storm Boris. It's been another fine day here, but the river continues to rise and it's flooding. It, well, it's flooding low regions regions with low land. It's flooding uh, this area here. It's obviously flooding roads and infrastructure as well. And I want to show you just how much of an impact this fallout is having. I'm standing in front of the halls of power, Hungary's parliament, the halls of parliament. And yet, if I go take a few steps down here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Water is lapping at our feet. And I was here earlier today and could easily walk across, not anymore. Now, Prime Minister Viktor Orban, he gave a press conference earlier today. The expectation is that these floodwaters will peak on Saturday. And by mid next week, he says these embankments could be open again. Until then, the flood defence efforts are well underway. 15,000 volunteers are registered here in Budapest. And as we covered earlier this week, one million sandbags have been deployed. However, despite all that, it remains some very uncertain days ahead. OK, Aaron Daman, thank you for that report from Budapest. Mark Steele from Opava, Czech Republic, and of course, a video chair there in Wrocław, Poland. Thank you all for that, those reports. Using the floods for political gain, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban is doing just that, using the current floods in Europe as a tool to politically attack the European Union. The Hungarian leader has criticized the EU's offer of aid for member states who were struck by this natural disaster. Brussels is hardly surprised, though, as it's not the first time the conservative Hungarian government has stood in opposition to the rest of the bloc. Uh. Prime Minister Viktor Orban has his hands full with major floods sweeping through Europe. So much so, he even cancelled his speech in Strasbourg on Wednesday. While the EU is extending a helping hand to its member states, the Hungarian leader has taken it as an opportunity to take a job at Brussels. With all due respect, if we had waited for help from Brussels, we would be up to our necks in water by now. The latest comments from Prime Minister Orban, while not surprising at this point, have left a sour taste in Brussels, even among other conservative groups. Their MEPs, first and foremost, want to help the victims of the flood, not engage in political disputes. Viktor Orban is many times worse 
harassed by the European Union establishment. But in this uh, concrete situation, we need to do everything what we can to support people. The right-wing Hungarian government has been at odds with the rest of the EU for years. Its pro-Russian sentiments and heavy reliance on Russian energy have been the main bones of contention. Mr. Orban is famous for politicizing things, for selling things for his own uh, political purposes. I don't like it. I think the uh, situation is too serious, I mean, you know, to try to um, uh, dress up uh, flooding into something as almost EU is responsible for situation uh, happening on the ground. While attending the Budapest Forum, our correspondent Aaron Damen asked the geopolitical analysts about their thoughts on Viktor Orban's antagonizing strategy and where it is heading. This is something that uh, the Orban regime and Viktor Orban personally likes to use. So he likes to build enemy pictures who he can constantly blame wherever, uh, wherever they, are, uh, they are at stake. What we see here is actually a free rider strategy, enjoying all of the benefits of, uh, of the European integration in economic and financial term, while also benefiting uh, from a strategy that he's actually all the time playing against the rules. Hungary's rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union runs out on December 31st this year, and most of the European Parliament will likely be relieved when that happens. From Warsaw TVP World, Kazimierz Wyszak. Earlier today, the European Parliament overwhelmingly passed a resolution calling for further support for Ukraine and ramping up pressure on Washington over long-range missile strikes on Russia. Our Ukraine correspondent in Kyiv, Oz Katerji, has more. The European Parliament has just passed a resolution calling on all Western countries to lift the current restrictions on Ukraine to use Western weapons for deep strikes inside uh, Russia. Now, this comes as the uh, European Commission uh, head uh, Ursula von der Leyen announced a further 160 million euros in aid for Ukraine. Uh, 100 million of that euros of that uh, is to be used uh, from seized Russian assets, or rather uh, the interest accrued on those seized Russian assets. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen also announced that she is planning to visit Kyiv uh, on Friday uh, for talks, further talks and discussions uh, in Kyiv with uh, the President Volodymyr uh, Zelensky. Now, another thing that the European uh, Parliament called on uh, was to accelerate uh, the weapons supplies that have been already been pledged to Ukraine. Uh, that's something Zelensky has also also uh, been keen on stressing. So uh, they will be hoping, Zelensky will be hoping, and government here in Kyiv will be hoping that they can get some movement uh, from the back of this resolution, although that remains to be seen in the nation's capitals uh, in question. Uh, it's Oz Katerji reporting from Kyiv for TVP World. Lithuania has had enough of Belarusian state-sponsored propaganda. YouTube in the country blocked 18 state-owned Belarusian media channels. The move was made possible by sanctions imposed on Belarus by the European Union. Thanks to Google's cooperation with the bloc, any member state can apply for a similar shutdown, with Lithuania being the first to do so. Potentially more will follow suit. Vilnius's bid to shield itself from Belarusian propaganda comes as Meta, the owner of Facebook and Instagram, banned Russian state media from its platforms worldwide. Announced on Monday, Meta's decision states attempts to carry out covert influence operations as the reason for the ban. The Kremlin seems to have been prepared for such a decision as they launched their own video platform, called Platforma, in July. Minsk has followed in Moscow's footsteps, creating their own state-owned video outlet called Video Bell. Dubbed as Lukashenko's YouTube alternative, the platform launched just a week ago. In the case of uh, Video Bell hosting, uh, only official propaganda uh, users are able to upload some video, and they uh, can, in that way, limit uh, uh, the content. Belarusian authorities also created their own communication app, the Pesha. The app is supposed to be installed on government hardware as Minsk pushes for more control over online communication of their workers. Even now, regime uh, said that uh, more than 
350,000 of people tried uh, to use the Pesha. It's you know, it's very huge amount of people. Banning Russian and Belarusian media by international media platforms is seen as a sharp escalation of measures against both countries' propaganda. As the West tries to protect itself from their influence, Minsk and Moscow are becoming increasingly isolated. With only a few weeks left until the U.S. presidential election, both candidates are pulling out all the stops, campaigning in swing states. One crucial battleground state is Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump is rumored to appear at an event alongside Polish President Andrzej Duda in hopes of appealing to a key group of Polish-American voters. The latest polls from Pennsylvania show Trump and Harris in a dead heat. Depending on the pollster, Trump is seen leading by a percentage point or two, or trailing behind Harris by even as many as four percentage points. The Harris campaign has been taking steps to appeal to various voter groups in Pennsylvania. Today, freedom-loving Poles and Ukrainians are warning us of a new threat. Earlier in September, Harris released a spot aimed at Polish Americans who make up some 5% of voters in this key battleground state. So for those Polish Americans who, who have the Ukraine is their top priority for the election. I think Heros was sending out a clear message, which is vote for me. For those Polish Americans who will vote on other issues, let's say the economy, uh, let's say health care, let's say women's rights, of course, the, the Ukraine issue may not matter quite as much. Not to be outdone, Trump is also trying to woo Polish American voters. Sources close to the former president revealed that Trump is set to appear alongside Polish President Andrzej Duda during a campaign event on Sunday. Duda is known to have friendly relations with Trump and has on occasion referred to the Republican nominee as a friend. One day, I am sure we will be remembering those important moments when we worked together, but we also know each other as people, in a sense, as friends. Rivalry for the Polish vote is a sanctioned U.S. election tradition dating back to the early 20th century mainly due to large Polish migrant minorities living in the Rust Belt. Poles came out in droves to vote for Roosevelt, particularly in the aftermath of the German attack on Poland in 1939. The Polish minority also largely supported Eisenhower and Kennedy, a fellow Catholic, but since the 1970s it is no longer a unified bloc. The Harris campaign hopes to sway Polish voters by underscoring the Biden administration's support for Ukraine but some experts believe it might not be an effective strategy. The situation in America is more important, like economy. Um, all what candidates, uh, they say about the border, uh, about the future of uh, our country, is more important than the situation in Europe. In 2020, Biden won Pennsylvania by some 80,000 out of almost 7 million votes. And polls suggest that in 2024, the margin will be even thinner. More nuclear power. South Korean President Yoon Sul Yul arrived in the Czech Republic to push for the construction of more Korean reactors in the country. Korean companies are looking to carve out a share of the international nuclear power market, which has been traditionally dominated by Russia in recent years. Prague has selected Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power's bid for the construction of four additional reactors in existing Czech nuclear power plants. The project ran into legal trouble with American Westinghouse and French EDF, which want a piece of the nuclear pie. Both are contesting the Czech Republic's decision to accept the Korean offer in court. The South Korean president's visit aims to ensure the project will proceed. Nuclear power has long provided us with a reliable and cost-effective source of low-emission electricity and is literally the pride of the Czech energy sector. It already generates around 30 percent of our annual power demand and is expected to cover up to half of the total demand in the future. That is why we need two new nuclear units. Yoon's visit to Prague will take four days and will include talks on expanding cooperation in areas of nuclear power, trade and technology development. The trip comes a week after the South Korean Prime Minister visited the country as well to discuss cooperation in developing other alternative energy sources. As a driving force for future growth, the two countries decided to continue to seek ways to diversify cooperation in clean energy, like hydrogen, and in the future, high-tech industries, such as the small modular reactor. The visit to the Czech Republic is part of a broader Korean effort to expand into the international nuclear power market. A Korean company is also set to build four reactors in Poland.
Western and Russian nuclear power sectors are still intertwined, with some Western companies manufacturing equipment for nuclear plants and Rosatom, Russia's state nuclear power giant, as their sole customer. Rosatom has a firm grip on the international market and is responsible for all 13 reactors built outside China over the last five years. The South Korean push into the international nuclear market might provide new customers for Russia-reliant suppliers and undercut Rosatom's business. And now let's return to the floods that rock Central Europe. At least 21 people were killed throughout the countries affected. We know the damage will go into the billions of euro and will take months, if not years, to rebuild. But for now, let's dive into the political aspects of the response thus far. And for that, I'm now joined by the president of Visegrad Insight, Wojciech Szybilski. Good evening. Hello, good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, so far we've seen the politicians jumping into action. We saw this big press conference today. We'll get to that in a little bit. But emergency services working overtime to save lives and property. How would you judge the response to the disaster thus far? Well, in terms of response, it's swift, it's adequate, and let's hope it actually brings relief to those people whose homes and livelihoods were severely damaged. And uh, we see in most of the countries the response is immediate. Uh, there is no, no negligence, but it's hard also to neglect the fact that the flood is historic in, in its size and goes all across these countries of Central Eastern Europe. Right. Now, a painful lesson that we often learn after a fact that, uh, you know, many people are not insured for such events. How should politicians deal with this? This is always an issue when some natural disaster comes up. Uh. Um, it's a, it's a thin line they're walking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in, in any democratic uh, uh, game, uh, and politicians are always in this game for electoral uh, votes and popularity, they need to balance the statements uh, craft, which is basically responsibility and supervision of the authorities, also the principle of subsidiarity, so that the lowest and the most effective uh, help needs to be prioritized so they don't disturb but at the same time, if they neglect communication, and we've, we've seen that all around the world from the US, uh, from the big uh, hurricanes and late response because the politicians were not um, following the demand of the public online or in TV, but rather following the script um, of the legal boundaries, they were paying also political price. In these times, times of war, times of the heavy conflict between the East and West or the authoritarian tendencies and the democratic West, we have, uh, we have a demand uh, for uh, all of the leaders to actually show up, show compassion, uh, communicate, show that they are with the people. And in Central Eastern Europe about 10 years ago we had also flooding mm -hmm. and we've seen uh, the consequences of negligence in, com in communication. We've seen Petr Nechas, uh, who was the Prime Minister in Czech Republic, who was mm, of course caring, but he wasn't showing that he's caring. While Viktor Orban was at the same time jumping on offences and showing that he's in front of the uh, even the first responders. And these two styles uh, produce different electoral results. Petr Necha, soon after he was going away from the post, and Viktor Orban was just enjoying his popularity. We saw the meeting of uh, prime ministers of Czech, Slovakia, Austria, and Poland all together with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and the EU will give 10 billion euro in assistance, it now seems. Do you think that this is uh, a adequate from, from the European Union's perspective? Well, I think we need to be precise. It's not that the EU will give money. Uh, it's going to be pro uh, it's going to be reappropriated within the budget that we all decide upon. I mean, there is commission that su supervises the process, and there is a demand from several member states that they want and they have a plan to cut down on several investments that would be funded from the EU cohesion funds. And that money will be then put into the basket for relief and rebuilding the flooded areas. So we are not we're not talking about new money, but we're, take we're taking this money to the immediate needs, uh, the, the needs that are obviously there for, for the people. In many cases, it, it, it seems like possibly new money because there is, a, uh, there is a certain amount of the budget that would 
remain not utilized. And that always is part of the air every year that not all of the EU funds are being utilized. So I think 10 billion in the scope of the, for so many countries, in the scope of the general budget of the EU, that is not that much. Do you think it's possible that that number could grow? Well, uh, with business, we with rebuilding, we know these, these amounts grow. It's, it's, it's really about an investment. If we remember 1997 flooding in Wrocław, where all the prime ministers and, uh, and chancellor and Ursula von der Leyen, president of the commission met, this city had a disastrous flood in 1997, a big solidarity response, and then building back was better. The city today looks nothing like before 1997 because there were also private sources, there were also different governmental sources. So this is about building back, back better. I don't want to throw immediately the, the you know, message of hope for every homeowner who, who got flooded. But of course, this is an opportunity and we should look at it, especially that such crises are going to hit us again and again because of the climate change. Well, yes, we do see, uh, when we see these big floods, they tend to happen in the same areas, yeah? So um, we've seen that uh, 10 years ago, we saw that uh, again in 1997. Uh, another political factor that we need to look at is infrastructure. And if you, if you look back at the infrastructure improvements that were made uh, due to the previous lack of infrastructure which allowed such massive flooding, um, I spoke to uh, the mayor of... Uh, one of the Czech cities earlier today, deputy mayor, uh, and he was saying that the river flows were actually way far exceeding what it was back in 1997. Uh, but probably infrastructure, many billions will probably need to be spent on infrastructure. What are the what are you hearing in the Polish media as far as that's concerned? No, we also hear about the levels of and the amounts of water and uh, the type of uh, high water we have never seen before. But at the same time we hear more or less reassuring messages about Wrocław, the biggest town, because the lessons of the past have been learned, the investment have uh, been made. We, we've seen a big retention, um, uh, the, the a reservoir. reservoir of yeah. water, specially designed for containing big flood water, um, initiated for the first time, so that it, the water filled it out and decreased the tension, the, the immediate pressure on the, on the city. All of this is, is telling us that uh, you can make improvements, you can build back uh, better. Back in the days, I'm sure in the future, we need to, one, one thing about what we can say about people is that we're adaptable species and we're innovative. So there you go. Certainly. Well, I, I want to talk about, uh, before we finish up here, because we're almost out of time, but about Viktor Orban using, seizing on this opportunity to criticize the EU. Uh, what do you think the point is behind all this? Well, uh, he never ceased to criticize the EU. In fact, he was going to Strasbourg mm -hmm. on Monday and Tuesday. And he wanted to send some buses with migrants to you know, Strasbourg. And one thing that contained him was not the flooding itself, but his most serious contender that has been with the first responders throughout the whole weekend. And then Viktor Orban realized, oh, wait, wait, wait a second. I need to actually catch up with this guy. So. He, of course, has this old message because he has nothing else new to say, but he's, he's a bit looking like behind the corner and he's trying to do not the right thing, but he needs to score his points and it, everybody sees it, uh, what he does. With the redeployment of cohesion funds uh, to the tune of 10 billion, do you think he'll be seeking a piece of that pie? Well, he's seeking all the pies. He's declaring that he's going to sue Brussels with 10, no, sorry, 2 billion euro for to, uh, to um, uh, you know, get his cost of maintaining EU border. Well, he said that six years ago, the amount was only half a billion and never sued the EU. So it's just cheap talk. Yeah, well, someone's got to try and have their cake and eat it too. Um, Wojciech Przewilski, president of Vicegrad Insight, thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. And that concludes this edition of World News Tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time. Good night.